Okay, so today we're going to talk about working memory and cognitive control. And as usual, we'll have three parts. We'll have a talk about behavioral processes, brain substrates, and clinical perspectives. And I want to start talking about transient memories. And uh, there's a variety of evidence, biological, behavioral, medical, that indicate that, that there are distinct short-term and long-term memories. Um, this goes back to Ebbinghaus, who we talked about early on, who noted that there's essentially no effort to recall one to five nonsense syllables. You can do that immediately. But beyond that, it seems to be effortful. Um, there are studies with different chemical interventions, uh, protein synthesis, that will impair the sort of within session memory of a, few, of a few items, but not more. And from neurological, we know that there are patients can show very specific deficits to either short term memory, long term memory, or the transition from short term memory to long term memory, like the patient HM, who we talked about earlier. So we're going to talk today about these different systems and how they interact. Okay. The basic model uh, is due to Atkinson and Schifrin that sort of formed the framework for thinking about it. And their basic idea was that one has sensory input. It goes to a sensory memory, a buffer that is specific to the different sensory systems. And then attention is paid to some aspects of it, which put some aspects of from sensory memory into a temporary working memory, a buffer. Okay. And that this buffer then becomes the basis for a variety of control processes. And these control processes can be rehearsal, essentially repetition, coding, so reorganizing, making decisions, is this bigger than something or smaller, as well as using it as the basis for retrieval. So the idea is that short-term memory is this buffer, and working memory is essentially the actions you do on it. So people used to talk in psychology a lot about short-term memory when the idea was it was sort of this passive notion of what was in your buffer. Now we tend to call it working memory, um, and they're essentially synonymous. But the idea about calling it working memory is that it emphasizes that this buffer doesn't exist simply as a buffer, but it exists as a basis within which one can do various controlled processes. Um, and then some or all or none of the, what's in the short-term memory on the basis of these control processes transitions to long-term memory. And these control processes can bring things out of long-term memory back into the buffer. Um, we talked in previous lectures about declarative memory, semantic and episodic, non-declarative memory, and skill. Um, all of these can be sort of learned through repetition, and there's apparently an infinite capacity. You can remember an infinite number of presidents, well, up more or less. Um, you can learn an infinite number of sports or moves in sports, and you know, there isn't really an obvious finite limit. But in this short-term memory, you have a much clearer finite limit. So. There are these two, we, both of these are aspects of, sh of uh, um, the sort of the working memory, the sensory memory and the short-term memory. Sensory memory, there's one for each sense. Uh, there's actually quite a large storage. There's more than you might, might, might imagine. We'll talk about that. It decays very rapidly. Um, and it's the basis for the transfer to short-term memory. Unless you've sent something, you're not going to be able to get it into short-term memory unless you've recalled it from long-term memory. Short-term memory is multimodal. It can include all the senses. There's a relatively small capacity, and we'll talk about what that is. It has a quick decay that's sort of less than a minute, as opposed to here, which is about less than a second. Um, and rehearsal is how it's preserved. Um, as a, and it's from here that one goes to long-term memory. So let's talk about sensory memory. Our brief transient sensations of what you've just perceived Okay, we've just talked about all these aspects of it. Um, if this information fades so quickly, how do we know the capacity of each is, is, is so large? Okay, because after all, if the sensory memory is very large capacity, but um, it takes in your phase in less than a second, but it takes you a second just to enumerate some subset of it, how do we know that, how do we know actually how large it is? And that's work which, okay, so now, do you all see that? How many of those did you see? Huh? Huh? What? Okay. Okay, how many of those can you repeat back that you just saw? Uh-huh. Okay. Okay. So now tell me the what's in the second row. Okay. Okay. So this this paradigm is is called the Sternberg paradigm and what he showed was that of course if you cue people in advance, they can focus on it. 
Um, but what he showed is that even if you present it to them for this 300 milliseconds, a third of a second, and then once it disappears, you then tell them which row, they're actually able to report back almost all the information in it. So the idea being that it's decaying faster than you're speaking. So, so the key thing is, is that in the Sternberg paradigm, you, you present the, a, a tone, medium, high, or low, for example, which would tell you which row, um, and then you're able to recall it back, suggesting that all that information was there, but it's really just sort of, it, it'll fade faster than you could repeat back more than one row. Okay. So, I think we've just sort of done this. Anyway. So, anyway, this is what I described. This is the Sperling partial report technique. Participants report one row but signaled by after the presentation. And it suggests that sensory memory holds this big snapshot, which is fading very, very quickly. Short term memory, as I mentioned, is multimodal with a quick decay and transfer. And as I mentioned, the preferred term now is working memory which really refers to not only the short-term memory itself, but the actions that one can place on it. Some of the key distinctions, short-term memory is also very much what we think of as being in consciousness, while long-term memory is not in consciousness. Um, access is very rapid, while access is much slower to things in long-term memory. There's a clear capacity limitation. Um, long-term memory seems to be relatively unlimited, although I'm sure there must be some finite. And short-term memory is forgotten very quickly, Long-term memory is forgotten slowly, if, if at all. Okay. Um, so how much information can we hold in short-term memory? Um, so everybody, let me just read this out to you. 1, 9, 3, 11, 12, 2, 7. Okay. Um, and you keep repeating, this is the digit span, you keep repeating it. So if I tell you 1, you all say back. If I say 1, 9, Okay, we'll keep doing this, I won't go through. And once you start to get to about five or seven, then people start to fall apart. And this is the task that Muhammad was gonna tell you. Sort of how many, if I, keep, if I just repeat something, to, of course each time the digits span, it'd be different. Now of course you're rehearsing it, so you're getting better and better. It would be a different sequence each time. Okay, this is a big component of many IQ measures. So we tend to think of IQ as, as speed, uh, you know, your, or, or uh, sort of creativity or intelligence, but it looks like a lot of what, um, intelligence is, a big predictor of intelligence, is just how much you can keep in your head at one time, how many idea balls you can keep up in the air at once. Okay, and so digit span. So the idea is that you have all these complex intelligence tests, but turns out a big high correlate is just how many random digits can you keep in memory at once. And George Miller, who we talked about in the very first lecture, had a famous paper called S The Magic Number 7, Plus or Minus 2. And what he showed was that this number 7 really is sort of the, the median about how much we can store. Um, and it's why, for example, phone numbers tend to be seven digits, or they were initially before they became just a single button press. Okay. So, but what was important about Miller's paper wasn't the idea that, um, that you know, this, this magic number, this, this limit was seven, but rather that it was sort of seven chunks um, and that, that was quite distinct from the notion of how much sort of total information there was there. So for example, um, if the lists are meaningful, okay, so for example, if it's, you might be, have a hard time remembering eight digits, but if those eight digits are 1492, 1776, then you can remember them really easily. And the answer is because you've, you've, uh, you've converted eight digits to two chunks, which is the year Columbus discovered the Americas and the uh, year of the uh, independence in America. And so the idea is that it's not just the total amount of, of sort of information that can be brought forward, but how much of it can be sort of chunked into meaningful units that you can keep in short-term memory. Okay. So there's, so what this suggests is, as I said here, is that if you can recode information, okay, um, now, the way in this hat, so the point is, is that you can think about these, these chunks, these limits in short-term memory as being, in some sense, more like indexes to what you know. Of course, you couldn't do this chunking if you were, uh, you know, someone who didn't know anything about the history, okay? So your knowledge of history, your semantic memory, that when did Columbus discover Americas, uh, you know, when was the independence, this is all information in long-term memory. And so the idea is that you are, you are 
keeping a lot of information in short-term memory by essentially keeping just two indexes in your short-term memory that take the information that's meaningful and in long-term memory. Attention determines the duration. If you stop paying attention to this information, um, you lose the information. Um, uh, we saw this in an extreme version in HM or actually in uh, the video of uh, the, uh, the amnesiac we saw a video on a while back. You know, if you in his case, if he loses attention, it disappears forever. Okay. So that's the basic transient memories. That's where information is coming into working memory. Uh, Baddeley is the person who proposed uh, that short-term memory be reconceived as working memory. He described it as a workplace for the mind, like a blackboard, where we collect all the relevant information from sensory information, from relevant long-term memory, and transform it. And he described it as having three components. A phonological loop, which we think of as our inner voice. A sketch pad, which is like our inner eye. And a central executive, which is what is the control process, the attention. And he described it like this, with an, a central executive up here monitoring, update, rerouting information, and the central executive interacting with an independent phonological loop and a visual spatial sketch pad. Are you confused or just squinting? Yeah. It's the font, <laughs> yeah, it's, it's a little small. So the phonological loop stores about two seconds of auditory information. So an example is seven numbers, if you think about, you know, six, three, two, one, four, nine, eight, seven numbers takes about two seconds. So one question is maybe the short-term memory isn't so much about the number of chunks, but in fact, how long it takes to verbally rehearse it. Okay. Well, that was very quick. So the way you often try to rehearse, do something, is you rehearse it to yourself. You say it over and over again. Um, this is the phonological loop. And rehearsals, when we're rehearsing, we're primarily verbally rehearsing. And in a sense, we seem to be hearing in our, in our mind's eye. Um, what this means, for example, is that if you have words, long or short words, it suggests that you should actually have a, be able to remember more short words. And in fact, that's, that is the case, um, that people with a, uh, that uh, you have less capacity to memorize lists that have long words, in a sense, because, you know, supercalifragilistic expialidocious, and you're already at your two-second limit, and you've only got one word. So it also, there have been some other studies that I don't think mentioned here, that often people who, who have a slow speech, it's often slow internal, you know, people have a slow speech, slow internal speech, can often have a sh poor working memory. So this suggests why people from New York dominate so many academic fields, because we speak very fast and therefore we can remember a longer list of words than those of you who come from the hinterlands. Okay, I'll make some joke about Southerners, but I, maybe I'll offend somebody, so I won't. Anyway, um, uh, but y'all come back later and I'll tell you a story about intelligence down there. Um, so uh, let's talk about the visual spatial sketch pad. Um, it holds both visual and spatial information for the manipulation. We think of it as the mind's eye, mental imagery. So here's a visual speech pad, okay? Everyone put away your pencils, okay? And so now I want you all to imagine a four by four grid. You can close your eyes if you want when you do this. With a one, so it's a four by four grid, there's 16 squares, okay? And I want you to imagine a one in the second column of the second row. Okay? You all have that in your mind's eye? Now I want you to place a two to the right of the one. In the square above the two, put a three. To the right of the three, put a four. Below the four, put a five. Below that, put a six. To the left of that, put a seven. And now tell me what number is above the seven. Two. Great, okay. <laughs> I know, is wow a partial credit answer? Okay, so the answer is two. 
Now, so to have done this, sorry, this is what you should have had in your mind's eye. Okay, and there's essentially no way to do this without okay, sneeze, without without uh, sort of creating a mental image. Okay, so the visual spatial sketch pad has a limited capacity. Okay, but the capacity is independent from the phonological loop. So a number of studies have shown that as you fill up your visual sketch pad, you also have a you know, independent of your phonological loop. Okay? It's well studied. We know more about the visual sketch, sketch pad biologically, as we'll see later, because you can get animals to do this. It's harder to get animals to do phonological loops. Okay. So a lot of visual spatial sketch pad studies done in animals, both behaviorally. Um, this is a, a monkey from uh, the NIH labs, right down where Mohammed and I were yesterday. Um, doing a study in uh, Mort Mishkin's lab on delayed non-match to sample. Okay, so keywords here, this is, a very f this is often called DNMS. Okay, so it's a, a well-known task. Delayed non-match to sample. So the idea is a novel object is shown. Okay, um, so the monkey, let's see, excuse me, excuse me. So the monkey sees something here. Okay, sort of the blue cylinder. Then the screen comes down, that's the delay. Then the monkey has to prick what is the object that's not the same as what he just saw. So the non-match to sample, okay? And the reason they do the non-match to sample is that there's sort of an innate thing to sort of, you know, if the monkey saw that there was a, a you know, sort of its innate response, if it saw here that there was a peanut underneath the blue, its natural response would be to look again for the blue. So, so you're, you're learning something because you're learning to sort of override that, that implicit assumption. And this requires a visual memory of the object to be held in mind. So not the spatial location, because these objects can be anywhere, but the object itself, okay? So that's the sort of the visual as opposed to spatial. Working memory, the working part of your mind, the central executive, the CEO, um, and just like in, in the corporate world, the CEO is the highest paid. Um, it's the most, uh, most complex. It exerts cognitive control over behavior, providing complex organization in response to environmental demands. So it's this, it's this executive which is taking task demands, information from long-term memory, information from the sensory store, and working with it. So that's really going to be, so the most, these are pretty straightforward to understand. The central executive is the most complex, both behaviorally as well as biologically. So let's talk about cognitive control and central executive. By the way, so a lot of textbooks in our, in our book, we talk about working memory and executive control. It's often called cognitive control. So here are some of the behaviors that involve the manipulation of working memory, okay? And some of the tasks which are used. So the idea is that unlike other aspects of cognitive function, where there's a very clear, there's, there's something very simple. In working memory, you have a variety of things because you're talking about control processes. There are many control processes. So for different control processes, there are different behaviors. So controlled updating of short-term memory. So what that means is you're, in some controlled way, you're deciding what goes in and out of short-term memory, okay? There's something called the end back task and the self-ordered search, which I'll describe in a minute. Setting goals and planning. Um, actually, Musa, can you run up and find the, do you know what the Tower of Hanoi is? Do you know where it is in the lab? Can, can you run grab it? Thanks so much. Okay, setting goals and planning, Tower of Hanoi. Task switching, that's sort of going back and forth from one thing to the other. That's like, you know, doing your texting while you're driving, which of course none of you should ever do because we know what the consequences of that are. Um, and stimulus attention response inhibition. Okay, you all just did the Stroop task. You were focusing, you know, you, you had to use your working memory to focus in, in, in several ways. One is you had to attend to a particular stimulus that, or a stimulus attribute, in this case the color or the word, and you had to inhibit a response. So two aspects here, attending to what's relevant and inhibiting what would be your natural response. So all of these are aspects of manipulation of memory, and these are some of the tasks which I'll describe, okay? So this is the end back task, okay? So the end back, and of course can be anything. Uh, when a target number seven appears, 
tell me what item appeared two ago. So this is the two back task. Okay? So I'm going to be giving you a list of numbers. Let me see if I have this here. And I want you all to shout or make some other demonstrative noise um, when uh, the seven appears, I want you to tell me what number happened. Okay, so no, let's take it back. When the number seven appears, I want you to all shout out what number appeared two ago. Okay? Okay. Okay, so you all did the right thing. So you can see how, uh, how difficult this is because you're constantly having to swap out the last, in the new number, swap out the last one. It, it, you can see how this is sort of this, con that's, that's the key essence of this controlled processing of short-term memory. Okay, now you should all be really having a headache in the left lobe. Okay, another task that's used is self-ordered memory task. Okay, and the idea here is there are these six items and there are six, six cards that each have one of these images on it. Um, and, but in each, each card, they're in a different order. Okay, so, the order, so they're the same six cards. Okay, and on the first card, I want you to pick any one you want. Um, on the second card, you can pick any one that you want that you haven't picked already. In the next one, you can pick any one you want that's not one of the first two. So it's self-ordered in the sense that I'm not telling you what, to, what order to do things in. But as you keep picking one, you have to remember what were all the ones that you did before and inhibit choosing one of them. So as you might imagine, this is the easiest part. This is the hardest part. So you're, you're essentially having to monitor yourself and monitor what you remembered. Um, this is often done, this is easily, you're looking? No, I'm just trying to figure out. Yeah, these things are a little small here. but. Um, uh, one of the reasons this is an interesting task is it's been used in both humans and primates. So in primates, they start out by choosing an item not yet selected. So you imagine you start with a peanut in each of these. The first trial, it can reach into any of them and take a peanut. Then you give it again in a different order, and of course it only gets a peanut if it chooses from one it hasn't picked, and again the same way here. So it sort of, it naturally lends itself. In fact, the human version sort of was adapted from this, which is a very natural animal version, because it's easy for an animal to understand that once it's removed the fruit or the nut from a particular bowl, there's not going to be there anymore. Musa, you want to come on up and uh, explain the Tower of Hanoi task to everybody? Do you know it? power to another, another like, location okay. by, in, by moving one of these. Well, actually, actually, it usually starts on one side. It usually starts like on the, okay. We'll put moose on the, on, okay. So you have to move this entire thing to another. Um, you have to move it to the end one. The we'll end move one. it from the far left to the far right. The far right by moving one of these at a time. And uh, the one rule is you cannot put a larger one on top of a smaller one. Okay. You want to show us? the entire thing. Oh, look at the bird over there. Okay. So, while you were doing this, what was going through your mind? What were you thinking? I just had to think like one step ahead, like I put this one here. Uh-huh. But did, were, you, were you thinking just about, I have to get this whole problem, you know, the whole problem was you had to get the, uh, all of them in the other one in the right order. Um, but while you're doing that, what you're thinking of is, is you, you have a sub-goal, which is, okay, I know that the first thing I have to do is I have to get the big one in the far right. 
So you sort of, that's your first goal. And once you've done that goal, you know you have this next goal, which is the next one. So you're not necessarily thinking about the whole problem at once. You've, bro you've, you've created an initial sub-goal. You know that the first thing you have to do. Okay? And so what's going on here is that um, you're taking a big project, you're creating sub-goals, and you have to keep in track. So you have to keep in track at any given point of what's your final goal, what are the rules, you know, big can't go on top of small, and what's the next thing that I want to do, which is putting this, you know, the, the next largest one on the far right. So you're keeping in track, at this, at the, to do this, you have to keep in track where you are, what the rules are, and what's the next sub-goal. Okay, this is a very taxing in working memory. Um, this is also a useful skill when it comes to a doctoral dissertation. It may sound like this incredibly huge project, and it's going to take two years to do, but you kind of divide it up, and you figure out, well, I need to do this thing first. And you focus on that, you get that done. And so it's, it's, it's that kind of ordering. Frontal lobes are really important for finishing your dissertation. Okay. Um, this is another task um, which involves switching. So one of the things that uh, is important, the frontal lobes are important. I'm, sorry, I'm talking about the frontal lobes. I'm sort of getting ahead of myself here. That executive function is important for is learning sorting. And so what you do in this task um, is you are you have a, an experimenter who's sorting the cards, who's bringing cards out, and you have to guess where each card is going to go. And the, each card can be defined by numerosity, the number of items, by the color, or by the symbol. And the experimenter keeps at various points shifting the rule. Okay, so initially they may sort them by color, and each time a card comes out you have to say which pile it goes in. And then at a certain point, they'll switch so that it becomes by shape. And you need executive control to sort of keep track of what's the current rule, what's the current stimulus, and so forth. Okay? So that's sort of rule updating. Now you all just did this, right? You all just did this troop test. So you know that uh, it is involving paying attention to what's a relevant stimulus, tuning out what's irrelevant, and inhibiting responses that are innate or more reflexive, okay? You've all done this. So we've talked about intelligence. So working, people have tried for a long time to understand what is it. Well, well, intelligence is one of these things that people talk about a lot, okay? Um, it's kind of like love. We talk about it a lot. We write about it a lot. But it's really hard to define. But, but we pretty much feel like we know it when we see it. Um, and uh, intelligence is similar in that way. It's been used for a long time. People try to sort of understand what it is that makes one person intelligent or more intelligent than the other. How do you measure it? How do you evaluate it? We think of it as the capacity to learn, to reason, and to understand. Um, working memory function has been long correlated with intelligence. It correlates with verbal SAT scores. Um, the NBAC training task um, increased scores on this working memory test, but as you train people to get better and better at the NBAC task, it actually improves their scores on general intelligence. So it suggests that you know, your score on general intelligence isn't necessarily something that's innate and fixed, although it's often talked about that way, but you can actually train some of the skills through these working memory. So let me summarize. Uh, transient memories are distinct from long-term memories. They're easier to form. They don't require protein synthesis and are not disrupted by damage to the medial temporal lobes. Atkinson and Schifrin propose that transient memories are processed in two stages. Sensory memory, which has a large capacity, a short duration, and one for each sense. And short-term memory, also known as working memory, which holds about seven items, and it's attended to. It helps select information from long-term storage. And badly provide a more detailed theory of working memory consisting of three distinct components and emphasizing the role of this memory in working memory manipulation. Okay, any questions? The badly model has a central executive. Which, has the, which is control, manipulation, planning, a visual spatial sketch pad, the mind's eye, a phonological loop, which is the mind's ear, about two seconds, and working memory function, especially, especially the, the central executive, is complex and is critical for a variety of behaviors, including setting goals, selecting inhibiting behaviors, updating memories, switching tasks. Okay, so we'll just take a, a little uh, sort of application break. So how many people here listen to music when you're studying? Okay. Um, why do you listen to music when you're studying? 
And why do you not listen to music when you're studying? Because I'm with TV. <laughs> 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 Great. Uh -huh. So why might, for some people, why might the, the music help? Uh huh. Any thoughts? Why? Why? Well, for some people can actually filter out the music and uh -huh. focus on their study, whereas other people are actually distracted. Uh huh. So the individual difference is some people it just keeps them awake. Well, actually, it's like background noise. Like uh huh. Not actually listening to like like it has to have words. Uh huh. Like uh huh. I, I don't actually pay attention to it. Uh huh. Really? Mohammed, you have some? So, probably activating more systems that don't bring to the board to memory and probably, you know, enhancing, but not necessarily maintaining that particular point. For example, if you look at the music in the background, then you are activating the phonological loop part of the model. Mm -hmm. So um, let me just talk to the second thing. So working memory fills quickly and fades rapidly. So people often say, how can I improve your memory? And I say, well, write things down. That's the best way, because then you don't have to do it. So um, we all have uh, habits. Do people have particular habits? How do, you, how do you externalize things so you don't have to load your working memory? Yeah. Put them in your phone, in your calendar. Iman writes them on the back of her hand. So, any other. so anyway, so one of the best ways is to ex create externalized a lot of our things. So let's talk about the brain now, and particularly the frontal lobes, which I've been alluding to and you're familiar with. So the frontal lobes, um, so here we have the sensory memory, working memory, which we talked about as an interacting between declarative and long-term non-declarative memory. The prefrontal cortex is thought to play a prominent role in working memory function, and we'll describe some of the data. So here's the frontal lobes. Um, you can see the prefrontal cortex varies among different mammals. Mammals with better working memory function tend to have a proportionally larger prefrontal cortex. Um, and the prefrontal cortex proportions are similar between humans and some of the close other primates. So it doesn't seem to be what's that different between us and the primates, at least in terms of volume. Okay. Humans with frontal damage often have disexecutive syndrome. It's often why it was originally called executive control, although sometimes people now prefer to use cognitive control. They have a decrease in working memory and executive function. This causes a number of problems. Uh, a famous psychologist, William Penfield, had a sister who had a frontal lobe damage. She used to be a fabulous chef, um, but if you think about what it means to cook a complex meal, you've got the soup going now, then you have to start the, you know, the salad at this point, you've got to get this thing stirred while this thing is being blanched, these have to go in here at this. So there's a tremendous amount of working memory. It's like the Tower of Hanoi problem all sorts of goals and sub-goals all being timed. Um, after she had this frontal lobe, she couldn't cook. She sort of may, may know the facts of the recipes, but she couldn't put them all together to keep things going. Okay. Um, a successful accountant suffers a frontal lobe damage, becomes unreliable, couldn't maintain relationships, goes bankrupt. You're easily sort of swayed by whims because you really can't keep track of sort of goals and sub-goals and other things, and so you're only able to respond to the immediate stimulus, um, much like in the Stroop task, with you'd only be, you know, to do the Stroop task, you have to keep in mind the fact that, uh, no, I shouldn't say this, I should say that. Without that working memory, all you're going to be able to do is sort of be impulsive, and the impulsion is sort of to read. So we talked about decreased digit span. We've read a digit span before. It would decrease with someone with frontal lobe has poor memory updating. They have a lot of trouble with the end back task. Um, very poor difficulty with the, with the Tower of Hanoi. We think that Moose's frontal lobes are probably okay. Mm -hmm. um, good enough to go to medical school is sort of, you know. Um, what's that? Uh, um, poor task switching with perseverance, perseverance. So there was constant card sorting tasks where you have to switch. So one of the things you see with people with frontal lobe damage 
is they'll get focused on something, and even though the, all the feedback is, is changing, they just can't stop. They're like you know, a driver who's just sort of, as the accelerator, going in one direction. And overall IQ is impaired. Um, in, in animal models, lesions of the prefrontal cortex produce similar disruptions. Um, and this goes back to the 1930s, where they lesion the prefrontal cortex in monkeys and show a lot of similar performance deficits. Um, earlier on, they just knew it was the prefrontal cortex. Now we know it's the lateral PFC, the lateral prefrontal cortex, those on the sides. And in fact, we now have a fairly detailed anatomy of working memory. So that there's the prefrontal cortex as the orbital frontal cortex, the medial prefrontal cortex, and the lateral. Okay. Um, and within the lateral on the sides, there's the dorsolateral and the ventral lateral. Okay, the dorsolateral on the top, the ventral lateral on the bottom. And you see a lot of the discussion about the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex when it comes to executive control. Okay. So here's a task. So we're gonna all be monkeys. Okay. So I want you to all to pretend you're a monkey. Come on. I want to see your monkey. What? Okay, you're already a monkey. So focus on the cross. Keep focus on the cross, but note where the square is located without moving your eyes there. Keep focused on the cross. Okay. Now move your eyes to look where the box was. Okay. You all did that? Okay, so now you could all be a monkey at Yale, because if you can do that. Um, classic studies done by Patricia Goldman Rakich. Um, did this. So, oops. so the idea is she trained monkeys to do exactly that task. There's the cue, there's the delay, the eye has to go here. And what she showed is that neurons in the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex fire while memories are being maintained. So during this period, they fire during this delay section. Okay, although there are other monkeys, there are other, there are some neurons that fire when the cue, there are some neurons that fire um, with a response, and a lot of neurons that fire during this delay period. And one second here. Moreover, um, if you look at these different neurons, you'll see that there are different neurons in the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex, which code for um, where the uh, uh, you know, where the location is being remembered. So the idea is that during the delay, it's not just that you're delaying, but you're delaying and trying to remember upper right-hand corner. And what they show is that here's an example of a particular neuron that doesn't fire at all unless the monkey is remembering that it has to look down. So this is essentially a neuron encoding memory for the fact that I need to look down at the end of the, the delay. Okay. Um, let me just skip over this here. So let's talk about mapping some of the executive processes into the prefrontal cortex anatomy. So within the prefrontal cortex, this is sort of a, a broad overview. You have to kind of remember one thing. This is the slide to remember. Within the prefrontal cortex, different areas seem to support different aspects of working memory. I mentioned the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex is kind of the king of the working memory. It's the central executive. It seems to be critically involved in the manipulation of memory, what we have here. That's the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex. The maintenance, this rehearsal, seems to involve either the ventral, so the idea is the dorsal part's the more executive. The ventral part, the lateral, is more rehearsal, sort of the maintenance, with the left being language oriented, which for the phonological loop. Okay, and there's even some, there are some uh, subtleties here where anterior of the left ventral lateral, more involved with semantic information, posterior with more phonological. Um, and this, by the way, is consistent with a general gradient in the brain that more complex abstract information tends to be stored more anterior. Semantic information is more abstract, higher order than phonological, so a good way to sort of remember that. And the right ventral lateral is, is, is the visual spatial sketch pad. Um, it's become clear that all of this is not just happening in the prefrontal cortex, but in fact the, these areas are essentially setting up loops between the ventral lateral prefrontal cortex and 
the posterior areas of the brain where the sensory information originally came. So the cortical language and speech areas for the phonological loop, the visual cortex for the visual spatial pad. So one of the things that's sort of striking about this is we see here a psychological theory that was developed purely from behavioral data um, back in the 60s providing a functional framework that maps absolutely directly onto the anatomy. So it's a beautiful example of where a theory, a psychological theory at a functional level provides a roadmap for understanding the sort of neuroanatomical differentiation. Okay, have you all encoded that in your visual spatial sketch pad? Okay. If I say, you know, close your eyes and imagine what's below the vision, what's below this and to the right of the uh, dorsal retina. <coughs> So the dorsal lateral prefrontal cortex supports executive function and the ventral lateral supports storage. And that's the sort of the general story. And there are a variety of, uh, if you impair the self-ordered tasks um, with uh, memory manipulation, okay, which of these have I not selected? You see that with dorsal lateral. But on the other hand, the delayed recognition task requiring only memory maintenance doesn't, is not interfered by dorsal lateral. So you can do these double dissociations where a dorsal lateral lesion will interfere with these sort of manipulation tasks, but not just a simple rehearsal. Um, in contrast, in patients um, with uh, ventrolateral, they have problems sort of active maintaining auditory information or visual information, depending on uh, uh, where these damages is. So we can see, we can see from patients some sort of selective damage to the sketch pad or to the phonological loop. Um, brain imaging study shows that active maintenance of auditory information or visual information activates the brain region suggested. So that's another bit of data. And brain activity and self-ordered tasks, which we know of as a manipulation, um, selectively activates one side or the other depending on the modality. So, so we're going back here. Okay, so this is just the summary of uh, what we saw before. Okay, that's sort of the critical overview. Okay. There are a number of other newer directions that have come up in the last few years. Um, one is the suggesting, again, I mentioned before that there's a general heuristic that the more, the more you get to the front of the brain, the more higher order and abstract. Because we know, for example, sensory information, the visual cortex and so forth is back here. As it moves forward, we get higher and higher order interactions. Um, so that even within the frontal cortex, which is sort of the highest order, within the frontal cortex we see a, a gradient. So that in primate lesions to the posterior prefrontal cortex produce specific concrete task impairments, while lesions to the frontal portions cause more domain general. So I described it as, you know, if your goal is to make a sandwich, that's a very abstract notion. Spreading peanut butter on bread is a little bit more specific. Moving the knife from left to right is an even more. So the idea is you're taking an abstract goal and you're decomposing it into components. Much like, you know, Musa took the abstract goal of moving this pyramid from one side to the other and he decomposed it into specific examples. Um, and of course, here we have exactly that. Move all the discs to the right peg. That was Musa's general goal. He had a sort of a concrete sub-goal, get the red disc to the bottom of a right peg, and then a more specific one, which is to get to that, he has to move a particular peg. Um, a traditional view had been that uh, temporary memories are held just in the frontal cortex. People thought of the frontal cortex as the buffer. Um, we now think of it less so much as being the buffer, but that more that what the rehearsal is is that it's the coordinates that are sending rehearsal signals back to the posterior areas where the sensory information came in. The idea being that we are using the same brain circuits that respond to incoming sensory information to activate from the frontal lobe those same circuits. Suggesting that, you know, sort of rehearsing seeing a cow is activating some of these same cow representational areas as what happens when you see it by sensory. And the question is whether it's being activated by a sensory input or whether the ventral parts of the prefrontal cortex are activating it here. Okay. 
Um, let's talk a little bit about prefrontal control of long-term declarative memory. Um, working memory doesn't just maintain temporary information. It also coordinates the retrieval of long-term memory. Okay, like other executive functions, it depends on the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex. So strong activation of the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex one sees during retrieval of past memories. So remembering the source of a past memory. Okay, participants would learn words in two tasks and then ask to remember which task for each word. And we're seeing, so the idea is you have to remember something and then you have to use some task information to retrieve inf information there. So I tell you, here are a bunch of things that were in task one, you learned that, that's in long-term memory. Things you've learned in task two, long-term memory. Okay, now I'm gonna give you some instructions to tell you to go back and pull information out. So the idea is that, so it's not only is the short-term memory putting information into, working memory putting information from the short-term store into long-term memory, but it's also critical for a directed search from long-term memory, okay, back into short-term memory. So what's an example of using working memory to retrieve something from long-term memory? Yes, sir? Okay, you're trying to use it. It's like, okay, I've, you smell some perfume. It's like one of those little scratch and, scratch and sniff things in a magazine. And you're thinking, okay, now, what woman do I remember wears this perfume? Okay, you're gonna go through long-term memory and, f and find it. So you're keeping this, this odor memory, which of course is probably another store. Okay. So let me summarize the brain substrates. Working memory is supported by the frontal lobes, especially the prefrontal cortex. We see executive dysfunction, delayed neurons in the primates. Different components of working memory related to specific functional distinctions. Central executive, for the dorsolateral. Phonological loop is left ventrolateral. Visual spatial is right ventrolateral. Um, it's, there's some controversy of whether the prefrontal cortex stores the temporary memories or works to maintain them in posterior cortex. And there is growing evidence for an anterior posterior gradient within the prefrontal cortex that corresponds to, the, to an abstraction gradient from more abstract to more concrete. Okay, any questions? All right, so let's just talk briefly about two clinical disorders that we can gain insights into. Schizophrenia, schizophrenia affects many behaviors in many brain regions, but prominent symptoms include poor working memory, especially tasks involving central executive function. So some of the most apparent deficits you see in people with schizophrenia are many of these kinds of tasks that we've described. Someone with schizophrenia would do very poorly on most of these tasks. Um, consistent with that, we see a lot of altered frontal lobe function in imaging studies. Um, these are some older studies showing in healthy individuals and um, in schizophrenia, I'll just see this right here. Um, schizophrenics do poorly on the Wisconsin card sorting task. They also fail to show an increase in dorsolateral prefrontal cortex activity when completing the task. So healthy individuals, when they're working on the Wisconsin card sort task, will be a big increase in activation um, in the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex. In people with schizophrenia, you won't see that nearly so much. Okay? I think they're showing here, this is, some other, this is sort of another control task. But in the, working, in the Wisconsin card sort, healthy individuals are showing this left hemisphere activation in the frontal cortex. People with schizophrenia are not. Um, of course, why? That's a big question. We don't really know. But we do know that the medications for schizophrenia generally involve um, reducing uh, dopamine, um, most of the medications. The opposite of Parkinson's drugs, which involve increasing dopamine. And so suggesting that one of the characteristics of schizophrenia is excess dopamine in the frontal lobe. Okay. It's one of the reasons why when you give people with Parkinson's Parkinsonian medication that increases dopamine in the basal ganglia and the rest of the brain, you can cause hallucinations or schizophrenic symptoms because you're beginning to overdose the frontal lobes. Attention deficit, hyperactivity disorder. We see that a lot in the papers these days. It seems as if it's an epidemic. Um, you see difficulties with planning, organizing, keeping attention. Again, a lot of these same difficulties. Um, it may involve dysfunction in the prefrontal cortex as well as connections with the cerebellum and the basal ganglia. Um, we don't really know. 
Again, these are also treated by dopaminergic drugs. Children with ADHD have a smaller right prefrontal cortex than other children. It's an area associated with spatial attention and working memory. Um, Ritalin and other medications are stimulants that increase dopamine or block its uptake. So here, unlike in schizophrenia, where you're giving drugs to reduce dopamine, um, for ADHD, you have to give drugs that boost dopamine. Again, suggesting that with dopamine, as with many other neuromodulators, there's no such thing as more is better, but that there's sort of an optimal level, and if you have too little or too much, you need to bring people back into line. And genes with ADHD seem to be involved with dopamine regulation in the brain, consistent again with this idea that it's, among other things, a dopaminergic. So let me summarize the clinical perspectives. Some of the most prominent symptoms involve difficulties with the central executive aspects of working memory and decrease your inefficient prefrontal activation. Changes in dopamine function can explain some of these symptoms in schizophrenia as impairments of dopamine recycling cause milder but similar changes in executive function. And ADHD is also associated with poor working memory, perhaps due to noisy inputs from basal ganglia to the prefrontal cortex. One theory. So what should you know for the final exam for your general knowledge? So here's just a brief overview of some of the things that you should be able to, you know, as you look at this, you should be asking yourself, do I know this? So you should be able to describe the three basic memory components of the atkinson shiffrin model, identify two types of transient memory, describe Sperling's task, three components of working memory, explain the concepts of maintenance and manipulation, describe several ways in which the central executive is able to manipulate working memory, and describe the relationship between working memory and intelligence. You should be able to describe some of the common behavioral and cognitive consequences of frontal lobe damage, identify the three main regions of the prefrontal cortex, identify two subdivisions of the lateral prefrontal cortex, and the, describe the roles of each, and describe the evidence of frontal lobe involvement in working memory. Clinically, you should understand the relationship between schizophrenia and prefrontal function and dopamine, and how prefrontal cortical dysfunction can contribute to the symptoms in attention deficit hyperactivity disorder. So those are, sort of, those are the objectives from this lecture. So, of course, it's time for a retention quiz. So if everyone takes out a new piece of paper, puts your name on it. <laughs> okay, and just put down some information from one through eight. Anything that correlates to what should be there. I, I gave you a hint that you should. Oh, 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 oh yes. Is there a one to eight? Yeah, yes. No, this is not, this is not a random digit uh, task. You should sort of recreate from your visual spatial sketch pad memory. You can, Musa, you can kill that now. Maybe. 